in Advent, and we just finished up our last series, and now we are kind of pushing forward towards Christmas in this Advent season. Today, I'd like to talk from Luke chapter 3 on the wilderness prophet prepares the way. The wilderness prophet prepares the way. You all have heard this noise, or ding dong, right? And all of a sudden, you begin to scramble in a mad panic because you didn't know someone was coming to your house today. And if you're anything like me, especially if my wife hasn't been home that day, what tends to happen is I run to close all the doors that could be visible to the human eye. And then in 30 seconds, saying, just give me a second, right? As I'm making the mad dash to try to hide the mess I've made, so I don't get in trouble later, later for allowing someone to see what I just did, um, we're sometimes caught unprepared for company. And someone recently posted a sign I saw online, and it was the picture of a house and the front door, and it had this preemptive message on the sign right outside the front door, and it said, my house was clean yesterday, sorry you missed it. That's one preemptive way to deal with unprepared guests. In fact, many people now say that a clean house is a sign of no internet connection. That may be true in the modern era. Well, as we come into Luke 3, we are going to realize that the Jewish people whom Jesus was entering the land of Israel, he was coming to his Messiah, they would never be able to say that they were without notice, without warning, without preparation for the coming, the advent, the first coming of the Lord Jesus. They were given prophecy of his coming in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God told Adam and Eve that one of their descendants, the seed of Eve, was going to crush the head of the serpent. And then God continued to prepare them in Genesis 12 when he told Abraham, it was through you, Abraham, that all the nations of the world would be blessed. And then again, he continued this preparation when he spoke and he made it clear it was going to be not through Ishmael, but through Isaac that this promised Savior was coming. And he showed that in Genesis 22 as uh, Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Moriah. And then in Genesis 49, to be more specific, Jacob prophesied of his 12 sons, it would be the son Judah that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, would come from. You see, all of these were moments in God's history where God was preparing the way. He was announcing he was coming. And then it continues on many other places in the Bible. When we get to 2 Samuel 7, God says to David, David, it is through your line that my king is going to come. My savior is going to come. Well, you fast forward to Luke chapter 3, and we have the appearance of the wilderness prophet by the name of John. John is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, and his ministry is a one of preparation. Chapter 3 prepares us for what we've been studying all the, the last eight weeks in chapters 4 and five. Now, you may have noticed I said John is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. I know Luke is found in the New Testament, but his account is actually a part of the Old Testament era. In fact, Jesus himself said in Luke 16 that the law and the prophets were uh, until the time of John. And since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed. And so, Today, we are looking at the last and greatest of the Old Testament prophets, and we are going to see the wilderness prophet prepare the way. And I ask you, are you prepared? That's the question we're going to need to answer today. So Luke 3, hear with me God's word, verses 1 through 6. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. The word of God came to John 
the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission, the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked places will be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. We see here in the first three verses that the Bible is a historical book. Notice the pictures on the screen of the men that we've just read about. These are real leaders. The account we just read is not a book of fiction. It's not a book of fantasy. It is grounded in real history of the world. Like any good historian, Luke gives the historical framework. He gives the context. This is not a fairy tale account with once upon a time or in a galaxy far, far away. Luke's accuracy here as he talks about these different leaders is confirmed by archaeology and by historians. In fact, I think of the words of the archaeologist Sir William Ramsey, who said, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. His should be placed among the very greatest of historians. When we read the Bible, we should not read it as some sort of book that is detached from the real world. In fact, the whole point of Jesus and what we believe as Christians is that Jesus entered time and history. God from eternity added humanity and became a real man. These are real events that we are recorded. In fact, when you look down a little later in the chapter, in chapter 3, verse 23, if you'll look with me in your Bible there, we even find out, because of Luke's diligence as a historian and researcher, the age of Jesus when he begins his ministry. Notice it says there, in verse 23, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. As he was thus supposed, he was not the biological son of Joseph, but of course he was the adopted son of Joseph. Isn't that amazing? Luke is so precise. He gives us the age of Jesus as he begins his ministry and all of the leaders of the world. Now, there's a very important reason for that we'll get into in a minute. I want you to see here in verse 1, We see the political hierarchy of the day. And in verse 2, we see the religious hierarchy of the day. These are the movers and the shakers, the power brokers of society that Luke mentions. First off, we have the Caesars, Tiberius Caesar, who became emperor in the year AD 14. He oversaw many provinces before that time. But we can tell here with precision... Since Tiberius Caesar became the emperor in 14, and this is in the 15th year, you do the math, the year here is A.D. 29, when Jesus is beginning his ministry. And I want to call your account to the wickedness of the men pictured on the screen. They may have been world leaders, but they could have also had their pictures in the post office, because these were not good men at all. These were some of the vilest rulers and governors infamous for their wickedness. In fact, we know very little about them except evil. Tiberius was known for his severity and cruelty. We see next Herod and Philip mentioned. Now, it's important to note that there was Herod the Great. He's the monster of the Christmas story who tried to have Jesus killed in Bethlehem. When he died in 4 BC, his kingdom was split up into his three sons, We have Archelaus, who's mentioned in Matthew chapter 2. He doesn't last very long because he's a very wicked man. And then you have uh, Herod here, and you have Philip. So the, the territory of Herod the Great is split up amongst his three sons. Now, Archelaus is such a bad governor that the Roman government takes his seat away from him and gives it 
to outsiders. And by this point, A.D. 29, the outsider who's now ruling that region, Judea, of course where Jesus uh, spends much of his ministry, where Jerusalem is, is Pontius Pilate. Now, we also see here Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. This is the one that Jesus calls a fox. That's not a compliment, by the way. And then lastly, we have here his brother Philip, who reigns from 4 to 34 BC. So my point in saying this is that the political leaders were not good guys. But I need to add, neither were the spiritual leaders of verse 2. We see the high priest mentioned, Annas, who, re, who ruled from AD 6 to 15, and then Caiaphas. Now, Annas was still alive as Caiaphas ruled from AD 18 to AD 36. These men were hopelessly corrupt high priests. And of course, we know they were involved in the death of Jesus. Now, I bring all this context together to say this point. At the very moment in history when themes, things seem so bleak, so dark, if we were to make it our modern context, one bad president after another bad president after another bad president, maybe that's not a hypothetical. And then we could say one bad governor after another bad governor after another church scandal after another church scandal when it seems the kingdom of Satan is triumphing and the darkest hour of the night has come. Do not forget, God says, in the darkest hour of the night, daytime is on the horizon. The sun is about to shine. God's not done at all. Notice verse 2. At that very moment, the word of God came to John. The utterance of God came to John. We have this man, John, show up here. His message is not like our message. His message comes directly from God. When you hear this language, you can't help but think of the prophets of the Old Testament. This is showing us John is a prophet. Like when it says in 1 Samuel 15, the word of Yahweh came to Samuel. Or in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel 7, where we are recorded that uh, God's word came to Nathan. Or famously in Jonah, the word of Yahweh came to Jonah. Or historically, the last Old Testament prophet chronologically, Malachi, the word of Yahweh came to Israel by the hands of Malachi. Why is this an amazing statement here? It is amazing because the word of God had not come to any prophet for 460 years. Since Malachi, what is called the intertestamental period, there had been silence from God. Corruption had reigned. Darkness had ruled. There was a famine in the land, a famine from hearing the word of the Lord. And after 460 years of quiet, all of a sudden, God in his mercy begins to speak to his people again. Now I read this here, and I can't help but point out something. It's very interesting. Whenever God's word comes to the prophets or the apostles, it's the word of the Lord came to them. But I want you to remember whenever Jesus speaks in the Bible, it never says that the word of God came to Jesus. And the reason why is very self-evident. Jesus doesn't need the word of God to come to him. He is the word of God. He is the eternal, everlasting creator. He is the one who spoke and this world came into existence. God's word didn't come to him because he is the word. This sets John apart from the one he is the prophet of, coming to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a secondary application here that I want to mention, and that is that this message from heaven was an inward call sent to John. And we, as a church, we have elders, and there's pastors in this city and around the world that if you are called to the ministry, you need an inward call. You should never, ever take upon yourself a ministry. I know there, the word office is important too. There's offices in the church, but even more important than office, a lot of people can stand behind a pulpit. Not everyone can fill the pulpit because not everyone has a calling or ministry. 
And you should never do this unless you have a word from God. The call of God and you would say, woe is me and I can't do anything else unless I do this. I'm reminded of the words of J.C. Ryle here. I want to read them to you because they struck me as I was studying. And I think this is a good reminder. Let it be a part of our daily prayers that our churches may have no ministers except those who are really called of God. An unconverted minister is an injury and a burden to a church. How can a man speak of the truth that he's never tasted? How can he testify of a Savior who he's never seen by faith and has never laid hold on for his own soul? The pastor after God's own heart is a man to whom the word of God has come. He runs confidently and speaks boldly because he has been sent by God. I read that and I just wanted to make the application. Oh, I hope you pray, church, for the children in this room and the students in this room that God would call some of them to serve him in ministry. That the word of God would not only save them young, but call them to serve him with their all in greater ways than you and I have ever served him. I was talking uh, this week, not in the church, not to a member of a church, to a family. I've gotten to know just a little bit. It's actually at karate class. And I was talking to them. And I was talking to a little boy, young man, um, who's, I'm not even sure if he's double digits yet. But we were talking about Jesus. And he was saying he was so burdened to tell his family and friends and the world they needed God. They needed Christ. It brought such joy to my heart. Oh, that God would put his word like fire into the hearts of the children of this church. The students of this church. You don't have to live for the world before you live for God. Just like you don't need to stand out in the middle of Mobile Highway and get hit by a truck to know it's painful. (laughs) Oh, that God, may, may we pray. Hey, parents, would you pray? Join me in praying. Grandparents, praying for our children that they would hear the word of God and his call like John and they would serve him. Now, the word came to John, the son of Zechariah. The Gospel of Matthew calls him John the Baptist, or you could even translate that John the Immerser. The name John, of course, was given earlier in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 by the angel Gabriel to his father Zechariah. And he is often called the Baptist or the Immerser as his nickname because of what he did. He baptized people. He immersed people. And by the way, I I have to tell you, if someone asks you, why are you a Baptist? Please don't say because John the Baptist started our denomination. That's not exactly accurate at all. However, he was an immerser. He did immerse in baptism. And I want you to see here, remember I spent all that time talking about the leaders in the first two verses. Where is John's ministry? Is John's ministry in the capitals with Herod and with Pontius Pilate? No, not so much. John's ministry, where God sends him, is not to these corrupt leaders, but to the desert, to the wilderness, to the valleys of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, to pebbles and rocks and brushwood and snakes, and to small little desert towns and villages. I think this is very important because if you read the Bible carefully, if you understand the Old Testament, it is always in the wilderness that God has chosen to make his meeting place between himself and his people. The wilderness is a place of silence, of loneliness, and where God often speaks the loudest. Paul goes to Arabia for years before he begins his active ministry. I think here John shows up as a type of Moses. Remember, what did Moses do? He took the people into the wilderness 40 years to prepare them, important word, to prepare them to enter the promised land. The people wandered there 40 years because of unbelief, a period of testing and trial and discipline to ready them. And John brings them to the wilderness to get them ready for the Messiah. It is sometimes in our darkest moments, in our loneliest moments, when everything seems to be wrong, we are finally broken enough and our pride is squashed enough so that God will start to lift us up. 
And the voices are calmed down enough that we hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 20 spoke about this. God said, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord Yahweh, Adonai Yahweh. Think, God gave Israel the law in the wilderness. The tabernacle, the worship and priesthood of Israel was given to them in the wilderness. What a shock. Usually, a coming king or great leader, his coming is arranged with the most expensive price tag possible. Nothing but the best. Break out the most expensive wine and champagne. Five-star hotels. The best clothing. The best preparations. And yet, our king, God of God, light of light, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes in the meager town of Bethlehem, laid in a manger, and the one who prepares his way does it in the humility of the wilderness. Yet God often works in the small and quiet ways of the world and confounds the wise. Now, I think there's a third point here to mention, and that is the God-fearing Jews of the Old Testament of John's day knew the importance of the wilderness. We forget how important it was. Because every year in Israel, there was a feast called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The day when God would make a sacrifice through his high priest to cover the entire nation. And there was two animals that were killed on that day of great importance. We read about this in Leviticus chapter 16. There would be two goats... One goat would be called the scapegoat. One goat would be killed and its blood would go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later temple and poured on the Ark of the Covenant, making propitiation. That's a theological term. An atoning sacrifice, a covering for the sins of the nation. But there was another goat, the scapegoat. And what we read about is that after the atonement was made in the holy place, Aaron, the high priest, would lay his hands on the head of the living goat, confess over it all the iniquities of Israel, all their transgressions and sins. He would lay them on the head of the goat symbolically, and then that goat would be sent out into the wilderness by the hand of the man ready to do this. And that goat would bear on itself all the iniquities to an isolated land. In other words, one goat was symbolic of the fact that God has covered our sins. The, The punishment has been taken for our sins. But the other goat showed that God took our sins far away into the wilderness, never to be remembered or seen again. And what is John's message? A message of baptism, of repentance for what? The removal, the forgiveness of our sins. Don't miss this beautiful picture of the wilderness here. Now, we don't get John's physical description here in Luke 3, but Matthew 3 does give us it. John was an interesting looking guy. He probably wouldn't be, our our security team, our emergency response team would probably have a long conversation with him if he tried to walk in this church this morning. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. Sounds like a wild man, if you ask me. He does sound like he's a man of the wilderness, doesn't he? Reminiscent of the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Now, I I have to be honest. I've actually rode a camel once um, in Israel. But uh, camel's hair doesn't sound so pleasant to me. And I did a little research. So there is a fine type of camel's hair that is used in expensive garments called camlet. But I'm sure this was not that fine hair. This was the long, shaggy hair of the camel. That very cheap clothing is still made by today in the East. It is rough, pointing to repentance. It's pointing to the fact, don't be comfortable in your sins. He wears a leather belt, just like the prophet Elijah. And then my favorite part of all, his food were locusts and wild honey. 
Now, locusts were clean animals in the Old Testament. The Jews were allowed to eat them in Leviticus 11. Eastern locusts were the food of the poor. They, kids, they were basically like grasshoppers. That's what they look like. So, junior high boys, I know you want to know this. How did they eat locusts? Well, they weren't chocolate covered like all these wimps eat them today, right? They would tear off the legs and the wings. They would take out the entrails. They would stick them in long rows upon wooden spits, and they would roast them on the fire and then eat them. That's a high-protein diet right there, brothers and sisters. What does locust take, taste like? Well, if John was the first Baptist, it has to taste like chicken, the Baptist bird, of course. <laughs> Why does he eat locusts? Locusts were a sign of divine judgment in the Old Testament. That was an animal that was an animal of judgment. The uncomfort of, Job's, of John's garment, his diet here, is reminding us that sin deserves judgment. Would such an uncouth figure be allowed to preach in our pulpit, in our city? Probably not, but it didn't matter in the wilderness. And God often humbles the prideful arrogant by speaking to them in people they would not normally want to listen to. But oh, when the darkness comes, you have no choice. When you're down on your face before God, you'll listen to whoever he sends. So, he's a herald. He's a preacher. That's who John is. The word preach here literally could be translated a herald. A herald's job is to announce that someone important is coming. A king is coming. A ruler is coming. It's not their job to make up a message. It's simply to give the message as it's been relayed to them. And he says, there is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In this Advent, we need to prepare our hearts for this king that's coming. We need a baptism of repentance. What is repentance? The Greek word here, metanoias. It means a change of heart, a change of mind that leads to a change of life. Three things, change of heart, change of mind, change of life. I think there are three aspects implied here in this word. Number one, repentance implies sorrow for the past. 2 Corinthians 7 says, There is a godly sorrow that produces repentance. You know what crocodile tears are. They are not repentant tears. This word implies not eyes rolled, I'm sorry, but from the depths of your soul, you feel your failure, your helplessness, the weight of your sins. Not just here, in here. Secondly, repentance implies a deep sense of the evil of sin committed not just against others. Children, students, listen. Not just because you got caught. We're often sad because we got caught. Busted, we used to say, right? That's not repentance. But because you have sinned against God. Psalm 51, David says, You, against you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. When Job comes to a reality of who he is and who God is, he says, I repent in dust and ashes and I reject myself. Your repentance is not about you. It's not about just fire insurance, not suffering. It's about the fact that you are a sinner and you've offended a good God who's loved you and pursued you and given you life, breath, and all good things in your life. But third, repentance implies a full purpose to turn from them and to live a holy life before God. You know your sins. You mourn over your sins. You forsake your sins. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who lives. So turn back and live. The point here is this change of mind will produce a change of way in your life. It's like uh, to use a car analogy. We were on the highway of sin, driving as fast as we could to the city of destruction, to borrow from the Pilgrim's Progress. And repentance causes us to swerve and do a U-turn. Last night, uh, my son and I went downtown to take a walk. 
We had no idea the Christmas parade was going on. No idea. We saw all this traffic. I knew I didn't want to go too much closer downtown or I'd be stuck for three hours. So I swung a U-turn to park far away. I'd rather park two miles away than wait four hours later, right? Repentance is you're driving to the city of destruction. You're on the highway of sin and you do a U-turn. And now sin is in your rear view and you see the city of heaven. You are on the highway of God, the highway of holiness. God is with you. And by the way, when you start going that direction, forget all that God is my co-pilot stuff. He's in the front seat and he's in the wheel and you're following him. That's repentance. By the way, some people have wrongfully said that John's repentance was different than our repentance. I just want to say to you that is absolutely wrong. John chapter 1 verse 8 says that John came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. John's repentance was not just a turn from your sin. It was also turn to Christ. Believe on Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You got no Christmas if you ain't beholding Christ. You're not prepared. You're not ready at all. Notice third, it was a baptism of repentance. This is so humbling and shocking. The wilderness prophet prepares the way with a baptism of repentance. Understand the context of the first century. In the first century, Jewish people never got baptized. The only person who ever was baptized in water among the Jews were the priests of Israel they had a ceremonial baptism called a mikvah. So before the, the priests would enter the temple on holy days, feast days, they would actually ceremonially go down into the water and come out. But outside that, Jewish people never got baptized. The only people who ever got baptized were the Gentiles. If a Gentile wanted to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Gentile had to have a confession of faith in him. They, if they were men, had to be circumcised. And third, they would be ceremoniously baptized, showing the washing away of their sins and that they were now in God's covenant. Now, John is saying to Jewish people who were full of pride and arrogance and a lot of hatred, ethnocentricity, a lot of demeaning thoughts about the Gentiles. John is saying to them, if you want to be right with God, you got to prepare the way. You got to be like a Gentile. You've got to go down in the water. You need to be baptized. Think for a minute, why did John baptize and why did he do it at the Jordan River? Remember, John's like Moses. What happened in the Jordan River? That's where Israel entered the promised land. God has always used water in the Bible. In the flood, in the crossing of the Red Sea, the ritual washing of the priests, Elisha and Naaman and his baptism and healing. John offered a baptism that was not a magical ritual. Instead, it was an outward sign showing a repentant heart. It was a matter of the heart because the heart is always the matter. To participate in this baptism was to show I need God's forgiveness. Being an earthly descendant of Abraham is not enough. Being an ethnic Jew is not enough. That does nothing for me. I need to be born again. I need to have my sins washed away. I need to turn to God. Some of my Presbyterian friends often mock Baptist because we say baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. And then I was reading John Calvin here, and he says the same thing. A sacrament of baptism is not a dumb ceremony. It's not exhibiting some unmeaning pomp without doctrine, but the word of God is joined to it. You get baptized because of the repentance and forgiveness of sins. It gives life to the outward ceremony. This is the peculiarity of baptism. It is said to be an outward representation of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We've had a few baptisms lately. God willing, we might have some Christmas Eve if you've trusted in Christ. What are you waiting for? Follow Jesus in baptism. Talk to me. We'd love to see you obey him in baptism. 
It is for the forgiveness of sins, the removal of sins, like the scapegoat took the sins of Israel into the wilderness, never to be held against them again. So when you read this, God takes the sinner's sins and he sends them so far away that even on the last day of judgment, God won't be able to find them because they were placed on Jesus Christ, the lamb, and they're gone forever. Well, in our last minute here, you notice the prophecy in verses 4 through 6. This prophecy was written 400, or excuse me, 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, there is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. That's loud volume. That's passion. The person who's crying out here this message is disappearing in the background, but their message is the trumpet. Listen to the message. Prepare the way of the Lord. How do you prepare? Well, when the door hears this, you believe someone's there. You know it. And you get your house in order. You get ready for who's coming. I want you to notice here, the way you prepare is repentance. A change of heart, a change of mind, a change of life. But this isn't just any guest. This isn't a friend after church showing up to your house. This isn't even a politician. It's not King Herod showing up to your house. And you should be glad of that. It's not Pontius Pilate showing up. It's not Donald Trump or Joe Biden showing up or Ron DeSantis or someone like that. You might prepare for a world leader to come to your house. That's true. But this person who's coming is far more important than any of those meager men. Notice what it says here. Prepare the way of the who? Of the Lord. It's important to look back at Isaiah 40 to get this. You see, in our English Bibles, you'll notice on the bottom, the ESV, prepare the way of the all capitals, L-O-R-D. This is the covenant name of God, Yahweh. In other words, as the LSB rightly translates this, prepare the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. In other words, who is the king that's coming that John is preparing the way for? Jesus. Jesus is not just a man. He is not just a prophet. He is not just a priest. He is not just a king. He is Yahweh. This is God. God is leaving eternity and he is entering time, space, and matter. He is coming into his creation. The God who hung the stars will be held by Mary. The God who made the trees will one day be laid in a manger and then hang on a wooden cross and rise again victorious. God is coming. And here's the most amazing thing at all. It says here, if we are going to prepare the way, his path will be straight. This is such poetic, beautiful language. All the obstacles will be removed. The rough roads will be made smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of our God. The most amazing thing to all is that the wilderness prophet prepares the way even in our hearts. God would come and dwell with us. He would change your heart. Almighty God would live with you. Forgive you of your sins. Be with you, not just today, every day and for eternity. That's a prepared heart. That's a changed heart. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All flesh will see this good news. God's people with an eye of faith will see themselves sinners in need of repentance and see Jesus, the Lord and Savior, and they will do everything to get ready and get right and follow him. What obstacles are keeping you from Christ this morning? What has not yet been prepared in your heart and life? Is it ignorance? You just don't want to know. I will not read the Bible. I do not want to consider my sins. Maybe this whole sermon, you've been doing everything to ignore every word we've said. And I ask you today, you will not be able to run from this message one day. What are you waiting for? Ignorance will be no excuse on the day of judgment. 
Is it unbelief because you've been hurt, because of hypocrites, because of pain? If it's unbelief because of hurt or pain, friend, Jesus is the healer. He's the only one that will fix your hurting heart. Is it hatred? Maybe you have such coldness and hatred towards others, grudges that are so deep inside of you. They are the ravines, the valleys that God wants to straighten out. If you'll just turn it over to him, that hard heart. Is it discouragement or despair? There's no hope for me. I'm too great a sinner. The Apostle Paul would like to have a word with you. Murderer, hater of Christians, liar, blasphemer. Jesus meets him and says, why have you persecuted me? And sends Paul, a changed man, baptized, forgiven, follower of Christ to change the world. Could it be depraved habits, secret sins, pornography behind closed doors? Could it be secret sins in your heart? Things you're doing that you don't want anyone to know about. Thoughts, words, actions. Things you have not done, you should have done. Things you have done, you should not have done. You love darkness rather than light. Secretly. One day God says, all of that will be revealed. What is the obstacles keeping you from turning to Jesus? I call on you today in the words of the wilderness prophet, prepare the way. Jesus can come today and rescue you, get you right, change you, declare you his righteous son or daughter, member of the family, totally forgiven. Sins gone. Oh, that we would turn to him right now. Let us pray. Mm -hmm.